Welcome back, and this is still Cosmopolitan Market on the Nigeria Customs Broadcasting Network. And just recently, uh, we saw a report come from the World Bank stating that inflation leaves 7 million Nigerians below poverty lines in 2020 alone. A huge number, I should say, stating that Nigeria's economic growth is being hindered by rising inflation, stalled reforms, amongst other issues. And to discuss these and more, I am joined by my guest. He is Kelvin Fineface, a public policy analyst welcome to the program mr kelvin pleasure my uh, good to have you on the program i believe it's it's only ideal for me to start off by asking you the title of the report um from the world bank is resilience through recovery uh when you hear resilience and recovery what comes to your mind especially considering the fact that uh, nigeria as well as other nations have been through uh the the year 2020 which was said to be an unprecedented year very different from the other years we had seen and nigeria went into a recession from last year but we eventually came out of that so what would you say comes to mind when you hear the title of that report uh, resilience through recovery well basically it's trying to um give the nation uh, you know um words of hope uh to let people understand that yes we're going through what we're going through but you need that resilience the need to push through irrespective of what it is that we're going through if uh, the world bank came out with it took the world bank to let nigerians to know that about seven million nigerians actually as a result of the whole of this uh, pandemic and inflation has gone into poverty now that number could be modest uh, i believe which uh, as someone who is on the streets you know uh, interacting with people you get to the uh, the village you get to your neighborhood you get to see people you know that you know before now we are basically doing well with at least uh, up to three dollars a day but now can't even do one dollar a day um, to survive so you can tell that it, it could be beyond the number given uh, with the way things are currently in the country so modest resilience it's basically telling everybody to say look man buckle up just just push through it there's hope you know uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel I guess that's what they're trying to say. And don't forget, you know, they also have given Nigeria uh, some kind of loan. So in order to be sure that the loan can be repaid at a certain time, as agreed, they need to be able to push in those words that we uh, motivate the people to rally around the government to ensure that uh, we go through this phase and, and come out stronger. Well, Mr. Kelvin, I find it interesting that you're saying that the number 7.5 million people is modest. I mean, bearing in mind that we saw the during the president's speech on the 12th on Democracy Day, that's 12th of June, he came out to say that during his tenure, he had taken out up to 10.5 million Nigerians out of our abject poverty. And this, to me, seems like a contraction. I mean, two different reports saying two different things. So what would you say is the current reality on ground if one is saying something else and another <coughs> is saying something else well in in um, random sampling method one can easily deduce from both reports if the president said he has actually uh, so far six years into his uh, tenure he's been able to take 10 million 10.5 million Nigerians out of poverty abject poverty okay the word object is an uh, you know an adjective clause given to the poverty right so which means we're still in poverty if he has taken us out of abject poverty, probably still in poverty, not out of poverty yet. Then the World Bank had also come to say we have 7.5 million added to the previous numbers. You know, of Nigerians that have been poor, below the one dollar per day, you know, survival strategy. And so that tells you that it's very possible that um, if we take a, an accurate look of our data, current data, as we speak as a nation, the population data, which is within the band of 208 to 210 million Nigerians, if we take that band, we will know that we have close to about uh, 50, 65 in the modern states, you know, 65 to 55 to 65 million uh, mm -hmm. percent of Nigerians, you know, in, in poverty. Mm, that seems to be a very gloomy picture. Because we are the poverty uh, capital of the world. Uh, by international world uh, index, Nigeria is supposed to become the the uh, the world capital of poverty. What does that mean? It simply means that the average Nigerian, majority of the Nigerian, cannot afford one dollar a day to survive. That's what it simply means. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the street, you also see that everywhere. What could cause that is probably not probably um, inconsistency in government policies. 
not you know, your abs absence of coherence of government policies that are supposed to be driving people out of poverty. The president said he's been able to take 10.5 million you know, Nigeria, out of abject poverty. Yeah, you could say that because we saw the interventions we had done, uh, especially during the NSAS period, um, I mean, uh, during the uh, pandemic period, rather, when we had the global pandemic, the lockdown, we saw the Minister of, uh, um, uh, what do you call them now, Social... Um, humanitarian Affairs. Humanitarian and Affairs, uh, stating that they've distributed how many billion, you know, to Nigerians. Uh, to their homes, feeding school children. They were not in schools. So those data probably would have given to him as data that have been covered and no verifiable data to back up that yet. I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the presidency in court coming out to show us the number of persons that were reached, states, local governments, and names. So the journalists can go out there to verify this information and say, oh, okay, I was blind before, but now I can see because of the federal government's intervention. That we can know that then you have accurate data. But in sense of that, then they just mere, you know, bandaging of the data to assuage the minds of Nigerians. Because when we hear that 10 million, the question I want to ask, who are the 10 million Nigerians? Why do I still have that in my neighborhood that people are still that broke? I can't even afford uh, under Nara to feed for a day. It's sad. I mean, that's the reality. If the enabling environment is created, I believe more people will have been able to get out of poverty. Government cannot completely take people out of poverty, but government can create an enabling environment to enable people to utilize their inherent gifts. Because every human being has that gift given to him for survival. What we need to do is to articulate this gift and bring it into a place of exchange to get the things that we need or the things that we want. And so we basically operate a type of trade by barter, by way of our skills, uh, by way of our talents and giftings in, 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 a, in a common ground. But if the environment is not created, then people, the level of insecurity you find in the Northeast, Northwest, and now coming up also in the Southeast, is something that also will affect people going, to, going about their normal businesses. So a lot of people will be out of jobs, a lot of people out of, you know, uh, some form of empowerment scheme that they'll be going on. Because if you go to the Southeast, for an instance, especially in state, a lot of businesses actually have to close down because of this insecurity. So when you find situations, like what happens to those people? How do you get Get the data to know if those people are not among those the person that claimed that have been you know taken out of abject poverty and now finding themselves back because of insecurity if you go from babuja to all the way to uh casino a lot of uh, kidnapping that takes place also makes some people that used to travel for trade can't travel for trade farmers can't go to the farms for farming purposes because of insecurity, which you also result in into food inflation. Uh, currently, we have about 18 point something on food inflation based on government information. But in recent, it's about 37.5% inflation that we have in the country. If you want to, if you're that to me, I'll give you just a simple scenario. Uh, a loaf of bread used to be 400 naira, it's now 550 naira. Mm -hmm. That's about, that is 37.5% inflationary uh, trend that you're seeing there. That's just a simple thing to know. Uh, for me, that's my own simple way to know economic injustice in the country. Well, I don't need to wait for all of the data that are not complete to come about some of this thing they, they, they throw out there. We go to the market and see things for ourselves. What it was bred one month ago is now higher than that with about 37.5%. So it's a challenge. You've made mention of um, how gloomy this picture might be, saying about talking about businesses surviving last year, uh, the COVID-19 situation, and how most Nigerians cannot afford uh, $1 per day. And you have also made mention of the importance of data in all of this. How or what would you say is the situation, especially with our data collection um, agencies? Um, I would believe that we have the NBS on one hand, but then you, you're making it seem as though we don't have enough being done with regards to data collection. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, you know, I, it's not an understatement when I make that, uh, you know, um, um, allegations. Uh, we have a very poor data collection system uh, in the country. Um, I'll just give you a, a few data now. Uh, from our density, we have 200 and, um, about 245 million registered SIM, 195, about 195 million active telephone lines, about 95 million um, active data subscriptions in the country. If we do a mathematical calculation of those numbers, 
like is being bandaged now currently, you realize that um, Nigeria as a country do not have an accurate data, clearly defined data as a people. The, the um, Independent National Electoral Commission have data of about 75 million going to about 80 million registered voters. Mm -hmm. If we clean up all this data, if you go to the banking <coughs> sector, the BVN have about uh, close to about 55 million to 65 million. Mean just add close to about 40 million now. All of this data are all scattered and not, you know, centralized, not even clean. So if we do an average um, estimation of who we are, and we look at the tele density, we look at um, the BVN, look at the N the NIN, and look at uh, um, INEC, we can come to the conclusion that we are close to, because 245 to 265 million registered SIM card uh, lines could be that one person have two or three. Like I have like three uh, SIM cards. So if everybody has such kind of number, the number could be high. So we can look at ourselves with, between the band of 180 to 200 million. Now, if we go by that data, how much of that data is the MBS? Do we have a reporting mechanism? I suggested a few times ago on air that it doesn't take anything for data collection. All we need to do, MBS need to be able to, in all local governments, in all local government, appoint people from the community. They don't need to employ through the local government system, through the traditional system, you get the chiefs within that environment, show them what they need to do, and give them a means to do that. Probably a phone to indicate for every bet that took place in that community, for every death that took place in that community, that information can be collected into a central data. What we need to do is simply send, it, send, send SMS. There is no community that you don't have phone. To reach yes of course some communities that i've been to recently i was shocked that getting to a place somewhere in Taki in kogi state no network in that environment which is a very sorry state uh, to speak of in the 21st century which means those people within that area are cut off completely from the values of life so for such a community they can do something different maybe go to the next community to be able to get that information that's one way to collect data secondly we need to begin to know how many members of this community are already in schools how many of them will be graduating for a certain period of time. So what is the way forward? In such manner, you'll be able to tell, look, okay, we are expecting that in the next four years, we're going to be having 100,000 100, uh, graduates from this zone. So it means that there will be need for jobs. So what are the uh, opportunities that are going to be getting us? The government will now begin to create those opportunities windows, either by way, by way of giving these tax incentives, you know, rebates to companies so that they, they can employ more people, then they can go and get money from the, you know, payee, you know, pay as the end so that tax can come back and through that way. Or the government can say, okay, because of this, thing, we're going to put growth in this environment so people who have interest to want to put real estate infrastructure can come up. So, or government can say, we're going to put, uh, you know, other infrastructure in terms of lights, uh, and all of those things so that business can begin to thrive in this environment those are the ways with which government open up the system for economic activities to take place but when government fail to do this and wait until when we have a situation at hand that's a five brigade approach what that does is that you don't necessarily have accurate data collection one two your 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 ability to reach out to the people is also will be very poor it will be infected with corruption because now we saw that happen during the lockdown period when you know the government you know came up to say they're giving food to those in schools and all of those things or we saw them on tv you know and in physical cash to beneficiaries and the public that in itself is a counterproductive economic me mechanism. All they needed to do is to en encourage us to go to the banks, open accounts with the closest bank within the environment, and put the money through the banks. And by so doing, the money will be able to hit some little interest before the money gets to the people. And the banks can also at the same time lend money to those who want to lend money, you know, from there to borrow money from there. And at the end of the day, the system will be hoiled. But what the government did, they gave money to these people, physical cash to these people, which also constitutes another security risk. Because when this cash were given to these people, what happened? Some people probably will follow them up, steal the money from them. Like we had one of the um, elderly women that was given money, she said, when they give her the money, as soon as she left, some people came back to her and said they made a mistake in the amount they gave to her. They gave her twenty five thousand other, but she ended up going home with only five thousand other. Some people say followed her up and said they gave, made a mistake and collected twenty thousand other back from her. I left only 5,000 Naira with that. So we, if that was one testimony, it means that probably other people also suffer the same fate. So we need to do things better in our data collection mechanism, in our approach to ensuring that people are empowered or given the right information 
government on our part, you need to also begin to look at our school system. What is our educational system? What is the curriculum that we have currently? I know for of a fact that the SCT school board, you know, is currently has introduced um, different skills that need to be taught in schools, uh, ensuring that for every school, public or private school in the SCT, that they teach one skill. To the puppies or to the students in the school. Now, if that is going on across the nation, what it simply means that uh, students <coughs> will finish school and come up with one skill or the other with which they can trade in the economy. But it's not just doing that. If the ND trains people, if ITF trains people and gives them a starter pack, we start also ensuring that government policy patronizes those products that come from the trainees. What it simply means, government will need to be able to you know, put on a policy that all government agencies, parastatals and ministries must, as first choice, patronize products and services from locals, except it's not available before they can import. If the president of the country today still drives a BMW, I mean a Mercedes-Benz, then there is that's automatically an unpatriotic move against local production. When we have innocent motors, not only just assembling, already manufacturing cars in Nigeria mm -hmm. for Nigeria. So do not to stop the president to ensure that he knows to produce all the presidential uh, fleets, uh, the vehicles in presidential fleets. Mr. Fineface, I would have to cut you short there. Still talking on policies which you have emphasized on. Uh, the, the report also talked about uh, a systematic coordination between the monetary and, and fiscal sides of government, especially with policy making. Uh, what Exactly, do you suggest the World Bank was saying when it talked about the uh, the systematic coordination between the policy and the mon the monetary and the fiscal sides of government? You know, uh, if you look at our current um, forex regime, you realize the lopsidedness with which we go about um, the exchange rates in the country has contributed to what we now have the Nara being beaten black and blue by the dollar. What they are basically saying, look, have, you know, a concrete uh, monetary policy that you know can go alongside with your physical policy because there must be a reality of relationship. You cannot be having a, a monetary policy that is completely divergent from the physical policy on, on ground, that you know that your physical policy does not necessarily um, encourage local exports. In the, text, in the context with which we see the level of insecurity is going on, then you now come up to ban certain goods, uh, you know, stop forests to certain goods. What that does simply, it will go in artificial inflation because when people source their phone to get the goods that are not readily available in the country, what it simply means is that the price of goods will go up automatically. It's a, it's a simple thing. Government, uh, the CBI need to be able to open line of credit with most of the countries that we import from so that you reduce the movement of cash from person to person or from organization to organization. When you give allocations to companies that don't buy things, but end up selling the same money in the economy to make profit, CBN gives out you know allocation to a company, uh, probably one uh, gives hundred thousand dollars to a company, and the company sort of using that for export now comes in turn send them because they get it for three hundred and ninety you know uh, naira per dollar. They come and sell it for three hundred ninety two, ninety two, ninety four. Then it goes back to the black market and be sold for four hundred and something so up to five hundred like we saw recently. Then uh, you're not helping the system. What you're simply doing is that you're enriching a few persons who can afford to spend so much money to buy little goods at the expense of the community of the good of the people. So the, the generator of the people suffers. Now, who suffers it? The man who buys the food, who buys the product, who pays for the service, the one who suffers it, the consumer. Not the big man. Not the middle man. But the consumer, then he pays for everybody. Because house rent will go up. Transport fare will go up. Uh, electricity bill has already gone up, you know, we've seen, and they've done that 200 times. And uh, you see every other utility that we utilize to ensure that we have, you know, our trade system, all has gone up. So price will automatically go up, but we'll pay for it. The man who consumes pays for it. And the man who consumes, if he doesn't have any productive or service-oriented, uh, you know, uh, um, a strategy put in place, then it backs out. He ends up becoming so broke and not being able to continue pay for everybody anymore. And that's why you see more people are getting to the poverty system because a lot of people actually lost their jobs. A lot of people, and even with the current uh, Twitter ban, a lot of people are actually losing their jobs because there are many people who are employed because of Twitter. 
we do businesses on Twitter. We make so much money on Twitter. Government have put this blanket ban is already affecting their businesses and making it difficult for the foreign, you know, um, uh, companies who want to engage some of our youths in providing some kind of virtual services, not being able to provide those services. Mm. And another thing that came up repeatedly in that report was inflationary pressures, which you have you have touched on on, on, on briefly. Uh, aside from that, we also heard the, the World Bank talk about the credit crunch, non-performing loans, as well as the GDP from last year, the recession that we faced. How far, how, how well you would you say the CBN has fared so far in curbing inflation, especially as we're seeing inflation? Uh, Currently at 17.93 percent, I believe. 18 points. 17 so, point now was February, and by April it, it was 18 points. It has dropped to 17. It has point. dropped recently, but yes. that's like uh, okay, yeah, it's that, just not this week. This just week, a no, few days ago. Two days ago. Yeah. yeah so inflation currently stands at that, or is that high currently? How would you say the CBN has fared so far with curbing inflationary pressures? If I must give, you know, uh, within the band of one to ten, I think uh, it's about four. Uh, that's how fair they've done. Uh, they could have done better, you know. But why they're not doing better? I think it is also as a result of political interference, you know, uh, from the executive and the CBN inability to be that independent to function as the um, the ombudsman in terms of our economy uh, to see that they can drive the economy to a, a position where we are able to do better than what we have currently. We shouldn't be going through this inflationary trend that we have at you know at, at you know currently you know at hand. We should have done better than what it is. If the CBN had projected early enough to know, you know, one of the decisions that actually um, affected us so gravely is also the fact that CBN banned every form of cryptocurrency transaction in the country. Without considering the volume of transaction that takes place, they anchored they, they anchor that on their on security reasons uh, because some persons started using that as a vehicle to be able to uh, commit the advance fee fraud and all of those things. But there are many Nigerians who do legit business with cryptocurrencies and making so much money that are self reliant, independent, without depending on government and are doing so well. Now, putting that, what that has done also, that also given some form of capital flight because a lot of Nigerians in the crypto space, which is second to none in the world, now are doing the p2p transaction and it's the highest volume in africa that amount of money is already gone and a lot of fintech companies in the country nigerian owned fintech companies are also not operating within our banking system so what they do they have shell companies somewhere and if any investor is coming from direct investors coming they go to the shell company pay the money the money stays outside doesn't come to the country by so do we don't have the volume of cash that should have been transacted in our economic system and so imagine Paystack was bought for $200 million. If that money had gone through our bank system, what that what would have done? That would have injected so much fund for Forex, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And we enabled the, the system to be able to borrow some of this money or sell some of this money to locals or manufacturing companies that needed to get these things. Then we need to, as a country, begin to tell ourselves what are the key raw, uh, components, raw materials that we need to be able to manufacture or produce some of these goods that we import and see that we bring in the technological know-how to the country, create incentives. Ireland got out of third world environment because of you know, high incentives, tax incentives created for companies to come established in Ireland. That I know of. In the early 2000s, I mean, they have been able to get out, uh, you know, uh, by 2000 and 2004, they were already out of the third world country because of 15 years stars break given to companies to set up. And what they did for that was that they ensured that their locals already have the skills needed to be employed by these companies so that by such employment they'll be able to reject the, the, the economy they, they, they invested a large amount of money to set up those companies and the, the locals pay taxes as the end to do to, to grease the economy then the purchasing power of the people increases because without the purchasing power how can economic drive there's no way the economy can be driven without the purchasing power of the people. We, the, we are in a situation where a lot of people have been castrated, you know, excuse my language, and they don't have the capacity any longer to be able to buy things that they ordinarily would have loved to buy. So those who love to take bread in the morning no longer want to take bread any longer because they can't afford to be buying bread in that expensive amount that is becoming now. So they resort to what? Uh, maybe look for where to eat one little biscuit that will cost. The 50 dollar biscuit that used to be 15 dollars, no longer 15 dollars anymore. You now need to have to look for 10 dollars to have to eat or 10 dollars to look for it to be able to buy that. How long will that continue? Mm. So the ripple effect of this, uh, uh, pig make used to be 500 gram per tin, but now it's 380 gram per tin. So what are we saying? There's a, the, the ripple effect of all of it. And you know, we can actually have 
the pick me to be cheap or a rare form of milk if we if we have our, our dairy industry you know functioning effectively with the cow bean ranch and have the high, high you know high yield uh, milk producing cow you know in 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 the ranches but because we're not doing things right we find ourselves in a situation we actually find ourselves by doing things right what then are you referring to because we have seen quite a number of policies come from government whether we like it or not we've seen quite a number of policies even with regards to forex we have seen the naira for dollar policy which was recently uh, released or what? introduced by the cbn was it sustained <coughs> it's had a time it's certain time for in government policies <laughs> It's part of the challenges that we have. How do we even get here? I could remember so vividly about three years ago, the CBN came up with this policy that um, you cannot have your domestic accounts. You cannot put the money to your domestic accounts. Uh, if you have a dollar account or a foreign exchange account, you can't put it. You know what I did? A lot of people got scared that the money will be seized. What did they do? They pull out their funds from the system and start keeping money at home. Right? And before it was happening, oh, the night came again, you have, you, you put it, but you can't take it. You know, at certain times, so you are allowed to take certain amount of money. All of those things are in those inconsistencies and in the policy, you know, uh, formulation is part of what is actually driven us to where we are today. Because people got scared. So if I leave my money in the bank, then I won't get it. So what do I do? They start keeping money at home. They start looking for ways to buy things that they can know they will see with their money instead of putting the money, leaving the money in the system to help the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, if government is really serious about the approach to want to take us out of this situation, one of the first things I think the government needs to do is that they already are, already have um, the data of manufacturers of in, in, in the country. Let there be sincerity in implementation. It means that all they needed to do, if allocation needs to be given, that one person must not be preferred to the other person in given allocation, either based on ethnic or religious sentiment or political patronage. Cronism has hit so deep into our fabric that the level of caution we have today is so high. And the reason why cronism has reached so deep is because of nepotism. Because nepotism is the highest form of corruption that gives birth to cronism. Cronism gives birth to the level of corruption we see today. If we take away nepotism and allow for meritocracy to take the, you know, the order of the day, what we begin to see, people who are qualified for government you know, loans or for qualified for um, government interventions will be those who will be qualified. And we see the ripple effect of those qualifications. But when we begin to do selective interventions, we're not helping the system. You know, you're also making people to begin to look for you to go to other countries. Why would you have a legal system that is devoid of any political inf you know, interference? The reason why Twitter is not in the country today is because we have an unstable legal system. Judiciary is not a, as effective as should be, as independent as should be. Imagine if Twitter was in the country and this ban took place. The Belgium would have been sealed up, businesses shut down with fiat, without going to the courts. If the court had given such pronouncement, it would have given investors the confidence to say, oh, this country, the legal system is okay. I'm, I'm guaranteed I'm going to get justice. In this country, we have judgment, but we don't have justice. So if we begin to think about how to put justice put in place, it means that the economy begins to boom. People, foreigners will begin to bring their money into the country because they know that if anything goes wrong, if any, any, any partner tries to undermine the relationship, they can go to the court to seek redress and they will get justice, not judgment. They will get justice for that. Such confidence will bring in more money. Then we also need to begin to look at how to reduce our appetite for foreign goods. It will start with the those in you know in authority. There is no reason, like I said, I said it before, why the president of the country should be driving the Mercedes Benz in the country. There's no reason. There's no reason why government agencies and Palazzo should be driving Toyota any other any other vehicle. There's no reason because we already have. Innocent motors in the country. I'm not advertising for him. We have, manif uh, you know, a local manufacturing company in the country. What we need to do is to strengthen their production output and ensure that vehicles that are produced are produced to international best standards. We have not motors, for instance. They also come up with fantastic vehicles, well beside vehicles that can be well driven our roads. So we need to begin to look at those areas. We need to begin to go and activate. Um, uh, the Mercedes uh, company in uh, Anambra go to uh, Kaduna and uh, Lagos, get the uh, Volkswagen wagon uh, company activated, Pijo, all of these companies activated, ensuring that vehicles are produced for us first before it's actually been exported. Once we do that, we'll be able to meet our international market also by bringing in more forex into the country. Then allow our youth 
to be the youth that they should be. Create a you know, regulatory framework. There is no excuse why we should not be taking advantage of the cryptocurrency industry and the blockchain. There is no excuse. For the 21st century, all we need to be doing is to be able to tap into that environment. They look at the blockchain. How can the blockchain help with our contracts, smart contract systems? And ensure that in our schools these things are being taught. Then we also need to begin to look at how to become a hub for international job market. India, India today operates as one of the hubs for as first, uh, you know jobs in the country. How do you do that? They provided capacity and companies now give them these jobs to do so. Call centers are man in India, warehouses. So what we need to do? Let's look at AI. Let's look at Internet of Things. Let's look at Twitter. Um, uh, look at. Um, coding and ensure that our, our school system focus on this area so as we get ourselves job ready to bring in. I know of a young chap who used to be a printer, you know, he used to be my graphic designer and he was able to get um, a contract from Fever, a website on, online and he started uh, working for a company in South Africa and they were paying him so much money while he was still in Nigeria, paying so much money. Today he has a big printing firm because of this foreign direct investment to his skill, to his own personal skills. So we can begin to allow these things to happen so that more people will be gainfully employed and more use will be empowered so that our production output will increase, our exports will do better. Then we want to look at our export agents and ensure that people, they create a neighboring environment. See, we can't continue to be taxing people unnecessarily mm -hmm. and expect things to run. The tax system in the country is long fighters, it's multiple transitions, and at the end of the day, people don't really make meaningful progress because of that. So we need to change all of those factors and see that we get this uh, economy moving and uh, make this country El Dorado. It's okay, possible that we become Just before we that. go, Mr. Fineface, a growth projection of 1.8% uh, for the year 2021 by the World Bank. How realistic would you say uh, this projection is? Well, you know, projections are designed to encourage you to work out towards it because if you have a goal in sight, you work towards it and even exceed your goal. It's not left for the country with this projection. By the way, why must it be World Bank coming to tell us our projections? Why don't we have the mechanism with the place? The World Bank works through different bodies to get this information. So all we need to do is to copy, edit, and paste the World Bank strategy in our own system because no matter how you like it the life that we live is copy edit and paste unfortunately we only do the editing we just copy and paste and think that that's how it works no copy edit and paste the solution the world bank is using the strategy they're using to get this information and ensure that all government agencies provide the three tiers of government should be able to local government the state government and the federal government should be able to get, gather data the fingertip so we can see how things going nigeria does not have any excuse to be broke I can tell you why. There is no state you go to in this country that is not that there is not abundant of natural and mineral resources with human capital. No state. Kogi State, for instance, have 27 viable, economic viable mineral resources. You can find gold on the surface of the of, on the ground in Kogi State. I'll tell you for free. If you go to Taraba, you can find blue sapphire in Taraba. And what do we do with that? If you go to Zamfara, the gold is already creating banditry in that zone. In Niger State, there's platinum, there's gold, both sides. So there's no state that does not have viable mineral and natural resources. From Enugu to Jos, there are more than 3 trillion tons of coal, not even an ounce used for any productive capacity. Is that not a wastage? We don't have any excuse. In terms of power, we can actually do decentralized power generation. How do you do that? Divide this country by 774 uh, local government. If you say you need 50,000 megawatts of power, it is very possible. It means that every local government, every local government can generate 64 megawatts of power. Mm. It's Through decentralized place. power generation. I'll have to cut you off there. Uh, but we hope that you come back some other time. Hopefully, to, to finish, if that will help uh, the economy to grow. To finish discussions <laughs> on, on this topic. I have been speaking with Mr. Kelvin Fineface. He is a public um, affairs analyst. And we have been speaking to issues around the recently uh, released World Bank development updates on Nigeria. And we saw the World Bank report talking to issues around uh, inflation and the credit crunch, talking about non-performing loans and other issues and also a projection of 1.8 percent for the year 2021 and this is the point where we wrap up today's edition of the program cosmopolitan market on the nigeria customs broadcasting network and we'll be back again with you on monday to keep you updated on happenings in the world of business and the global economy i am chema kainendu thank you for watching and bye for now